Chorus Voices, the podcast brought to you by Chorus, a fresh approach to community service. Settle in, listen in, and enjoy the voices who bring you reflections, musings, and stories from our community. Hello and welcome to this episode of Chorus Voices. I'm CEO Dan Minchin. Brandon people, Lou Forster. Hope you're going well today, Lou, and uh, and uh, our listeners are having uh, a good a good day. Um, today we're going to have a bit of a chat about uh, strategy and um, really about the journey we've gone on in terms of developing strategy within Chorus and and what that has um, has been like. And many people think of strategy as a, a poster on a wall or a or a, a little booklet with the sort of the five year plan in it. But um, at Chorus, it's been Pretty dynamic and uh, organic, and uh, and sort of emerged as we've gone along. Um, the way I think about it, uh, the in the pre-merger time, there were three different organisations forming a strategy and forming the view that the best thing to do for them was to uh, to merge. And the sort of combined board came up with an overview of where the world was going and what this new organisation needed to be able to do and what it needed to where it needed to head. Um, and then once the once the merger was completed, um, which was about the time I started, we had to move fast to bring this organisation together, which at the time didn't have a name. We called it Merge Co, um, which was pretty uh, unimaginative, really. And um, we had to do a whole bunch of things to sort of stabilise the organisation to establish a, a functioning kind of way of working. Um, that was without really having much of a strategy, other than to know that the world was changing. Um, and that we needed to change with it. So we made a decision to develop and launch a brand in the midst, really, of, of our transition of our three-way merger. As you said, you joined early 2017. And that was all very early in the piece, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Well, I, I remember having conversations with you. That was one of the first things that we kicked off, and we had a few different um, opinions at the table, and mm. we, we toyed around with doing it, not doing it, doing it less... Um, Intensively, especially the research phase, and mm. you know, in episode four, we talked about the brand development um, in this podcast, and Richard Beards, you know, really encouraged us to do it if we were going to do it to do it properly. Mm. So I think it's very interesting to launch a brand before you have a clear um, vision of your strategy. But but it actually really informed our strategy in in a funny way. Um, the brand work, which was at the time, like you said, it was it was really about thinking, looking, reflecting on ourselves, and thinking about what was important to us, and coming up with a, 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 a name, but also a, an identity um, that reflected where we were coming from. And for a while there, that was the most sort of significant element of of our strategy, to the extent we even had one. And the, and the work on the manifesto, it's just fed into so much of the stuff that we've done. And when we started the brand process, we didn't know you and I didn't know that we would be using a manifesto, <laughs> how yeah. useful it would be, strategy, culture, brand. It's, uh, yeah, it's really definitely that's an example of the emergent uh, nature of mm. strategy, I think. And, and, you know, one of the key players in in an in organisation strategy is the board and uh, the board of uh, Mergeco at the time, now Chorus, uh, was very actively involved in that brand work and again I think it was one of the first times and they still talk about the way that brought uh, that, that group together in articulating what it was that Chorus really stood for which is this, this fresh different approach to, to bringing community together, to connecting people and to enabling people to live the life they choose. Uh, so I went and had a, a bit of a chat with um, two members of the board, uh, Moira Watson, uh, who's the chair, and uh, Ray Glickman, who's the deputy chair, about what it felt like to do strategy at Chorus. I think at the beginning of 2017, we'd only really come together uh, towards the end of 2016. So we, as uh, the three companies that make up Chorus, had agreed that we would go forward as one and uh, the board itself had only just uh, been initiated towards the end of 2016, beginning of 2017 and we didn't have a CEO so that didn't happen until I think about February 2017. Mm. So it was a period of newness and um, not a lot of fixed things. We were finding ourselves in all of this and we were operating at a time 
uh, that pre uh, supposed why the merger happened, and that was a change in the context in which all of our sorts of organisations were operating. Uh, and change in funding, change in um, aspects of delivery, those sort of things. So really, um, it was a time of, I suppose, uncertainty and new opportunities, lots of things on the horizon, lots of growth opportunities because we were so new. And um, it was actually very interesting to enable us as a board to come together, then have the appointment of the CEO and then begin to build a company from nothing. So I found that particularly exciting because I'm a great person for moving forward and um, it was great to be able to do that. So from a strategic perspective, it was a greenfield site, but on the basis of quite a brownfield set of organisations. So there was a difference between um, what we'd come from and what we were going to. So great opportunities, I think. Yeah, I think that's a really good explanation of where we came from. I think because we were three different organisations coming together without any real structure or infrastructure. We weren't, we didn't so much, we weren't so much doing strategies, we had aspirations uh, as to what we wanted this organisation to be. I think they were pretty strong in setting this up and it, it, it wasn't, it, in the face of all of the challenges out there to be more responsive to customers and, and to um, withstand competition. We did aspire to do something new and something better than was being done at the time. And it wasn't just about, about putting three organisations together to make them bigger. And so, Ray, the, the challenge there is to sort of draw those aspirations out and start to, to bring them to life. What was, how did we go about that? Well, look, I think once, once we had the uh, structure that we needed, a board and... Uh, CEO and some of the executive together, then we, we were serious about strategies. So, you know, we, we've had already several uh, strategic sessions, um, yeah. uh, board and executive, to look at what we were trying to do. I think um, the, f the first few of those, though, were like, in a sense, operational strategy because we had to make this new organisation. So if that's not too contradictory, we needed to work out how to create this organisation to do the types of things we were wanting to do. But I think now and in the next year, certainly now that we Chorus exists and, and has been amalgamated, that job's not finished, but it's largely there. We are wanting and are focusing on what we want the future to be. And, and we've been you know, doing some serious work on, as a board in conversations with the executive and we have a strategy session one or two strategy sessions booked in coming up for the rest of the year. So I think in those, you know, as you know, the board aspires to uh, work out what this fresh course approach is actually going to be. Yeah, I think um, that the strategy that's happening at Chorus is not about getting a strategic plan. Um, and, you know, this is our plan for the next five years and, you know, then sub plans back from that. It's an emergent strategy. It's a lived experience. It's about identifying what it is that we're trying to build and then identifying how we might do that because bringing together three organisations, though they have similarities, they do have differences and how do you actually merge that? It's actually the bit, the transition and integration beyond a merger, that is the most complex to do. And how do you build a focus on the future, uh, which is that strategic approach, while dealing with the need to bring things together yeah. uh, and to build, as, as Ray just said, you know, that operational focus it's, was very, very strong at the beginning. And I think the board um, had a key role in building that. Um, and as the CEO um, and the executive came on, um, we could pass that over to uh, that group. But I think the board's um, still involved and I think it's right that the board should be involved uh, in that process. I think that that's right. I suppose trying to build something new. At the same time, we're very respectful of our heritage mm -hmm. and want to build on that heritage about what made our constituent organisation special. So, I mean, we talk a lot about the fact that we, one of them was a volunteer organisation and the others used, you know, were very keen on using volunteers. So we're kind of searching for this uh, role in the community 
that will not only help individuals as individuals and people in families, but also as part of communities. And I suppose that's nice, isn't it? I mean, we, we, are, take, we are trying to build on the history of, of where we came from and try mm. and create something that makes sense, you know, in accordance with that, but is something entirely different. Yeah, I see it as a very much um, an iterative approach. I don't think it's predetermined, and if it was predetermined, then there would be lots of choruses around, and there's not. Uh, so we are building something different, we are building something special, and I see it as a cultural approach. So rather than just the traditional... Uh, strategic influences. It's very much about immersing with the people of the organisation because the point, Ray, you made about respecting the heritage, I think that's very strong uh, in terms of there were three organisations, they were um, their own histories and we're bringing those three together to create a new chorus and the chorus is not just the sum of those three, but encompasses those three, the heritage, the history, but also builds to create something different, something new. And that's a little sweet spot that is quite difficult to um, just do overnight. And I think it's an emerging thing that, that we're managing now. And in terms of um, that approach, what, what's that felt like as, as a member of the board? Well, I think that it's been a rewarding and good experience for members of the board because we, it's not, I mean, if you look at the foundation of this, very few organisations have actually managed to voluntarily merge anything really, let alone in our sector. So I think that was a good experience to be part of that, where people put aside self-interest and, you know, and put the good of, good of the community, if you like, if that's not too hard for them. In place, but also I think as a board and executive, you know, we are working very collaboratively to try and nut this out, and uh, so that that's a good thing to do, mm. and we are able to have um, robust conversations amongst ourselves, and and we're free to disagree with each other, but still stay on course, you know, for what we're trying to do collectively. Mm. So, I think if you're going to create something new, you have to have that sort of creative tension in the system, otherwise you can't do it because you'll keep coming up with the same things mm, mm. and there won't be enough challenge in it. So I think sitting in those challenging places uh, is, is a good experience. And it gives us the opportunity as a board, um, working only as a board and also working with the executive group, to challenge ideas. And I think in the board room there is a sense of respect and there is a sense of it's OK to have a different view because people um, value the difference because otherwise, as Ray says, we'd just be producing a cookie-cutter approach. And I think, for me, the, one of the most um, eventful periods was when we looked at the branding and developing the chorus name and uh, there was not necessarily agreement at the beginning about some of the different name options that we put forward but the board was able to work through that mm. and that was really the first test because I think it was about April 2017 so the board had only been together for about three or four months um, and we we got through that so that gave me heart that we were on the right track and we would be able to um, build something that was new something that was different but something that respected the past. I really like um, picking up on the respecting the past uh, piece there. It really reminds me of uh, Damon Hurt, yeah, our colleague in the, the exec team, who talks about respecting the past, being realistic about the present and optimistic about the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really, really nice line. So we had some um, help to guide us on this journey, this strategic kind of development journey, the last kind of six, nine months. And, um, yeah, that's uh, here from someone we invited in to give us a hand. So my name's David Blythe and I work across a range of things. The bulk of my work is in the consulting space in strategy, leadership and change. Uh, I also teach strategy on MBA programs, both at UWA and at Curtin. And I do some executive education with Duke, which is a big global university. So that's the sort of skill set I guess I bring to the conversation. Fantastic. Well, thanks for coming and having a chat, David. I wanted to have a little bit of a conversation about um, strategy and some of the work that you've done with us at Chorus and you know we can kind of bounce in and out of, of some ideas but you've been working with us on our you know, strategic blueprint which I think is maybe moving into a roadmap with all these different terminologies but um, you know maybe can you tell us one thing that you know now that you didn't before you started working with us at Chorus? 
So I guess there are a couple of things that stand out for me. Most of, most of the fresh insights for me are context specific, right? Um, I didn't appreciate the extent to which the sector's transforming with the funding model. Uh, you know, that the traditional funding model was block funding to an agency that would, oh, sorry, from an agency straight to you guys. Now it'll go to the individual consumer, which really radically transforms the sector. So I'd never really appreciated that. Um, NDIS, you know, it's, it's interesting if you reflect on it, as you probably don't appreciate it as an insider, but as an outsider, it's, it's a good thing, but an abstraction. But when I got involved with you guys, you start to see it in its, in its real form and the complexity and the challenge the government's going to have to find a way, and the sector will have, to find a way where the service delivery model can match the funding capacity of the government. So I guess there are a couple of insights that for me were context specific. The other thing though that really was, for me was really interesting is not so much learning, but reminding me of some fundamentals. So, I was talking to Dan one day and uh, I said, you know, look, I think strategy emerges from conversation and reflection. And he looked at me and he said, and action. And he's right, of course, but uh, so there are a couple of things like that, that uh, things I've known for a long time, but they sort of, they fall into the back of your mind rather than in the fore of your, front of your mind. And uh, so they were really interesting insights. I felt like the process, you know, because it's happened over a number of months, you know, your work with Chorus, that in itself has been action. You know, each, each month it took a new path. You know, you, you met with Dan a lot, you met with the board, you met with the exec, mm. and it was it was a developing, evolving strategy, really, wasn't it? It, it was, and uh, for me it was one of the most interesting things, right? So most often when I get an engagement with a the client, they want to run a two-day strategy forum and that's the job done. You know, and you get a bit of engagement ahead of that, you do your forum and then you write it up. Um, this was really interesting and I, I, I really applaud that whole group, you know, the board, Dan as CEO, the executive, that they were willing to, in a sense, tolerate that sort of that rolling model rather than demanding that we just pump out a strategy at the front end actually allowed us the space to let it build over time. It's rare for organisations to do that so I think that that was a really interesting and really valuable piece for the organisation. That's great. I I really enjoyed the um, flexibility. You'd bring a model and you'd you know do an activity or an exercise, and then we would either think about our industry or our organisation or our customer uh, base or market segments, mm. and we'd really work through that model, and then it would adapt, and it you know it was a real iterative process. Yeah, it was, and uh, again, I love doing that, and it's it actually was a style or a, I guess a, a an approach that I adopted myself when I was first in a CEO role. I had a job much like Dan's, and. Over a period of months, I just would bring a model to the, my leadership group, introduce them to it, and then we'd have a conversation, just as you described. What what does this mean for our company, for our organisation? A month later, I'd introduce a new model, and we did this over a period of months. And then about six months in, then we had a two-day lock away, and it was a really profoundly good outcome from that. But it was built up over time. It wasn't one of these, let's just slip in, do a two-day workshop and slip out. So, um, One thing I liked throughout the process and continues, because you sent me something the other day, is that you, you sent um, the group interesting reflections, case studies, readings. Mm. Um, can you perhaps tell us about a couple of the ones you sent? You particularly sent ones around um, design thinking, yep. human-centred design, and they really got us thinking. So maybe tell us um, your thinking behind sending those and sharing those. Yeah, look, so I spend a large part of my days just scanning information. I mean, that, that's part of what I bring to the table when people engage me. And they're always fascinating stories. The skill for me is to find ones that will resonate quickly and readily with the client, right? When <clears throat> in this day and age, uh, you know, we used to say information is valuable. Today, it's almost overwhelming. So the real skill is to find something that you know a client will read and instantly get a lesson or an insight from. So the design thinking, I mean, I know German very big on design thinking. He's using that with his you know, frontline leadership team and so on and so I knew that would resonate and if you recall that this was a case around uh, from memory it was around food service in uh, for people who didn't have capacity to look after themselves 
um, and they fundamentally altered the model by putting themselves in the user mindset um, and came up with something far more uh, effective and far, far less expensive than the original model. So um, I, I like doing that. It's, uh, it's part of what I uh, enjoy doing. And one of the other ones was the Frome uh, project in the UK that you and Dan kind of thrashed yeah, them out so, a bit. So that was one that I think Dan might have been first to that. But it, the fascinating thing around that, it, it really is anchored around the notion that community matters. And the, the sort of essence of the case is that where you can build stronger communities, the cost of healthcare, the cost of helping communities who aren't as well positioned as others in the community, actually is dramatically reduced. So, and, and that resonates really powerfully, of course, for Chorus, because if you go to the manifesto, there's that strong orientation to community that's embedded in the manifesto and in the conversations we've had uh, around the strategy process. So the power of community is an enormous thing. Mm, I think that was that resonated with us a lot. Like you mm. said, it was some, it's something that we're trying to do, and suddenly mm. we got some evidence about you know a small town in in Cornwall in England that has has done exactly that. So. Yeah, I mean it is. It's always really powerful when you can find evidence for something that instinctively you you're sure is correct, but you can't prove it, and then you actually get data that demonstrates what you want. It really gives you a lift. Gives you something to sort of. For the doubters who say, "Oh, you know, that's all just that's all nice," but what about the economics? You can say, "Well, here's the economics. Mm. It's a powerful model." Very. Yeah. So look, there's David Blythe uh, reflecting on the journey, and and one of the things that popped out for me out of what he was saying is that, you know, when you're doing strategy the way we've been doing it, it's uh, it's very um, dynamic, it's organic, it continues to evolve. It's really an ongoing conversation. Um, which happens uh, you know, at the board and the executive, but now starting to happen across the organisation. What you need if you're doing strategy that way is some, some signposts and that uh, example of Froome or Froome in the, the United Kingdom uh, and, the, and the Compassionate Froome project and how it linked people together um, to deliver a fantastic community outcome um, really became an, a touchstone for us in, in thinking about what was going to be different about Chorus. I think the work we are trying to achieve in, in um, helping people to connect with others in the community is, is really key and links very much to the Froom project. I read a book very recently, Eleanor Oliphant is Completely Fine, <laughs> interesting title, but it's um, absolutely about loneliness. And this is a younger lady, and I uh, listened to the author talking in an interview, and she always thought that loneliness was just older people um, and read an article and was quite surprised that you know loneliness can happen to any of us and even those of us in jobs and with families or you know it, it's um almost like a state of mind and it's about being truly connected and having friends and, and things like that so yeah i i, I think the frame project's really really interesting and i'd love for us one day to be able to measure the impact mm-hmm. we make on people's lives and in our community uh, i'm sure we will and i, I look i think uh we could keep talking about this stuff um, yeah, for a long time, Lou, and uh, that is about right because it is an ongoing conversation here at Chorus and maybe we'll aim to come back in another year or so and uh, talk about where we've got to and whether some of these signposts have turned out to be uh, pointing in the right direction. Uh, it's been, uh, well, you know, I find this stuff very interesting. Uh, I hope our listeners do, and uh, so thanks, Lou. Thanks for listening to Chorus Voices, the podcast brought to you by Chorus. If you like our show and wanted to know more, check out our website at chorus.org.au and please leave a review. We'd love to hear your feedback and it helps others find us and enjoy the podcast as well. Join us next time for more inspiring stories and news from our community. Chorus, a fresh approach to community service.